So, we've said a lot about the about the concept of computable enumerability, but believe it or not, we're still so we're still not quite done. We've still got some things that I want to say about uh, this class re. Uh, the first thing I want to say is that in some sense, and this is, might surprise surprise you, in some sense, uh, re is the more natural class than R. And that's for a few reasons that are related to each other, and I want to explain why. In some sense, re is more fundamental as a class than R, and the reason for that is that there's an there's a more natural or I mean there is a natural there isn't one for R there's a natural identity uh, between Turing machines and languages in re that is to say, every Turing machine sort of has a natural language living in Re that's related to it. So every language, every, every Turing machine, no matter what, has a natural language uh, associated to it living in Re. And that language is basically this one. Uh, you know, for M, for a machine M, define L of M to be the set of all strings X such that M of X equals 1, such that M accepts X. I'm going to say it like that. That is to say M halts an acceptance on X. That's it. So that that doesn't associate because so I mean I'm basically if you just ignore all of the uh, def the uh, rejecting cases, then you have this. You can always define a language like this, and so every every machine and you can so you can go the other direction too. Given any machine, given any language in Re, you sort of have a natural machine. Now it doesn't go um, that that doesn't give you a one to one correspondence because there's multiple uh, machines that could be in a language in Re, but but. In some sense, every Turing machine sort of naturally lives in Re. And in some sense, you can kind of think of Re as literally uh, the set of Turing machines. I know I have a hard time not doing that sometimes. In some sense, the set of Turing machines is more naturally layered on top of Re than it is on top of R. It certainly is, actually. There is no layering Turing machines on R. Because by being in R, you're saying there exists a special Turing machine that does a specific thing. Whereas in Re, you're not really saying so much like that. So Re more naturally kind of layers onto, uh, so, so re more naturally associates with the set of all Turing machines. So, so re has a natural association with the set of all Turing machines. There's a kind of a natural identity there, whereas there isn't that for R. Uh, in some, so the next thing I'm gonna say contradicts that. Uh, in another sense, Uh, re is not the more natural class at all. So why is that? Uh, so in order to talk about why that is, um, we want to talk about uh, in what way re is special. And the way I want to explain this is I want to say, hey, you, computer science major, generic computer science major, watching this video, if you're not a computer science major, just pretend you are, you're more familiar with this class re than you realize. Why, you ask? Because think back to all of the times that you were given a CS assignment, like something to program, and you immediately thought of a, of a stupid almost solution in which you basically said to yourself, man, if only, this, if only I knew this would finish, if only I knew this while loop would end, uh, then I would have a solution here. But since I don't, I can't use this stupid algorithm. A lot of the time, you encounter problems in real problems in computer science where you have a half solution. In other words, it'll, you have a solution in the, in the case that something stops. In, in, in the case that something stops, what you're really saying is, if I, I have a solution in which I search for something, and the search goes on indefinitely. So I'm going to type that out. Uh, in many cases, we encounter problems 
which have a natural solution, a natural, and I'll put solution in quotes, solution, uh, which involves searching for something indefinitely. If you find the thing, you can stop, but you might not find anything. And you also have no way of knowing whether or not you've gone through enough stuff. So basically, there's a natural, uh, there's a natural association between re and unbounded searches over computable things, over, compu over, over sets that are computable. Because, I mean, presumably as you search, you're doing computation. So uh, as you search, uh, you're performing computations to decide if you found the right thing, if you found the thing. Uh, therefore, uh, there's a natural association between re and um, I'll call it uh, unbounded searches over computable sets. So that's another association with re. In fact, you can say this, and, I, and I'm getting a little ahead of myself. So there's this crazy symbol that you might have seen before in math which is a big backwards E. This E means there exists. And so you, uh, I, I'm, we're gonna talk more about these quantifiers. This is called the existential quantifier. And I can, I can kind of quantify over X and then I can say thing about X. Um, and so basically what this says, what this means in English is it's a compact way to say there exists an X such that thing is true about X. And so the thing that's true about X I can say is uh, the thing, so, so basically the reason I'm bringing this up now is that I can, there's a, de there's a third definition of computably enumerable that kind of captures this aspect of re, this unbounded search uh, kind of idea regarding re. A third definition of re. So a, uh, a problem L is in re if and only if there exists a uh, computable language a different computable language. So we've got a language here and we're claiming it's in re. It's gonna be in re if there exists a computable language, I'll call it J, um, which takes two inputs, uh, you know, so, it, so things inside of J are gonna be pairs, uh, such that um, X is an L if and only if, uh, there exists a y such that x y is in l or sorry in j so that's that's what that's what's going on let me actually so that's that's another definition and the reason so what what are we really saying here we're really saying basically that there exists a something that you can compute and have the computation finish um where uh, you can, if you just knew what, what the other kind of partner was, then you could find it. So, I mean, we call Y here uh, a witness of X's membership in L. So, uh, that this is basically uh, the, the idea of unbounded search. So, I'm searching for a Y that pairs that I, that I can make it. So, the idea is that Essentially, the, the, the while loop is just searching through every possible string y. And then for every string y, you're doing some other computation to see uh, if something is true. And if that something ends up being true, then x is in, the, is in, your, is in your problem. Then your prob the answer is yes. So this is sort of the like kind of 
uh, kind of uh, 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 purified essence of of the idea of an unbounded search of 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 a, of a, solu of a half solution to the problem in that sense that I described it. So why is this equivalent? So why is this equivalent? The great thing about equivalence is that you only, you know, if you've shown two things that are equivalent already, and if you have a third, then you only need to show equivalence between that and one of the two. You don't need to do anything else. So let's show why this is equivalent to the uh, definition in terms of an accepting language. So suppose, and I think, I think doing that will make this definition more clear. We have a um, machine M which accepts the problem L. So suppose we have a, a machine that, that accepts the problem L in the sense that L is in re in, in the old sense, in the sense that we started off these videos with. So uh, if that's true, then th what is going to be the language or the problem J? So the problem J is this. Uh, given a string x and a uh, number, I'll call it k, um, does uh, m halt on l, or sorry, halt on x uh, within k steps? Question mark. So it's just basically given a number of steps, does the machine halt in that many steps? Um, that's it. And so, uh, it, you know, x is in the language uh, if and only if, or x is in the, uh, the, the answer is yes. I'm trying to avoid saying language for a while still. We're going to get to that, I promise, uh, very soon. But, um, but yeah, so the answer is yes, if and only if um, there exists a number of steps, right? A number of steps k, such that uh, xk is in j. And this is just a very kind of uh, arcane way of saying uh, m of x halts in k steps. That is a computable relation. The, que the question of whether m of x halts is, is not a computable relation, right? But the question, does m of x halt in k steps, that's certainly computable. If you give a bound on it, then yeah, sure, I can scintillate for as many steps as you want me to. So that is, uh, you know, exactly the form that we, what we wanted here. So that shows that having, ex having a machine that accepts L uh, implies that you have this definition, why does this definition imply that you have a machine that accepts L? Well, that's easier. Uh, it, it's sort of there already, right? I mean, what's the machine that accepts the language? It's the machine, on the other hand, let me just write it down. On the other hand, uh, if have a J such that, uh, ex you know, X is an L, if and only if, and by the way, if and only if, and, and this backwards, for is backwards thing is mean the same thing. Uh, if and only if there exists a y such that uh, x, y uh, is in j. So if we have this, uh, then what we can do is we can think about the machine that just basically goes through all the y. So consider a machine uh, that we're assuming j is computable, right? So we're assuming, we're considering a machine that basically simulates uh, the machine um, uh, computing j uh, one at a time, uh, uh, one string at a time, one y at a time. In other words, this machine basically just goes through all of the possible computations of, of this uh, one at a time for all the y, i.e. figure out if uh, x, y is in j, which is exactly what we're saying is computable uh, for every y. You know, if, if that's the case, then eventually you'll find something. So if there exists a y, so um, if x is an L, eventually we'll find something. So halt and accept. That's it. That, then we have a machine that accepts the language. So th this equivalence is even more direct than the equivalence between accepting and, and being able to computably enumerate.
So this is yet a third definition. And the reason that I'm bringing up this third definition now is because there's actually a complementary class because there are two types of quantifiers. We have this big backwards E, but there's another one. There is an upside down A. So this is called the universal quantifier. And what it means, what it, and, and what basically the way it reads is, is it says for all. So I could say something like for all x something about x. So that, that's, that's another way to quantify. You can, you, you can, there's two types of quantification. There's existential quantifier, quantification. They're saying there exists an x such that thing is true. And then there's universal, which is for all x something is true. And these do have a complementary relation to each other. If I negate, so let me let me just go ahead and say this, and then I'll explain it. Um, if I negate an existential claim, I end up with a universal claim, a universal claim in the negative. So, for example, um, what what does it mean to negate? A, uh, um, uh, suppose I'm saying, you know, there exists a, ca a cow that's blue, right? W to negate that, to say that that's to, to the, the exact opposite statement to that is n all cows are not blue. So I, I've negated the claim, and I've also replaced that there exists with a for all, right? So I'm, if, I'm, if I'm taking the negation, I mean, this means negation, of uh, there exists a cow... Uh, x such that x is blue, so this is just a stupidly mathematical way to say there exists a blue cow, uh, then to negate that would be to end up with this, this if and only if and this back and forth, this means logical equivalence, by the way. So this is logically equivalent to saying for all cows x, x is not blue. So they have a complementary relation. If you, if you negate a, an ex existential claim, you end up with a universal claim of the negative. And if you negate a, a universal claim of the negative, then you end up with an existential claim of the negative. If I, if I uh, say all cows are blue and I negate that, then I'm, you know, to say it's not the case that all cows are blue is to say that there exists at least one blue cow. And so I'm back to my original claim, um, or at least the negative version of that. So these have a back and forth complementary relationship with each other. And so there is a natural kind of complementary class to re, which is to basically look at this definition again and put a for all there. Um, so I want to talk about that with the rest of, of the of rest of this.